Hello and welcome to New Game Plus. I'm Tim. I'm joined by Donald. How are you? I'm feeling three-dimensional because I've think, been thinking about the Nintendo 64 recently because it is, has recently been the 20th anniversary of that console. I'm just remembering, remembering back to those days. I never actually had one but I wanted one so, so badly. I had one, but unfortunately I threw out all the boxes that the cartridges came in and I had like the lunchbox things which you'd unzip oh. and it had all, all the cartridges lined up nice and neat. But now I don't have the boxes. Oh, so no. sad. Oh no, you don't have those yellowing pieces of thing around your house. Yes, that's true. But uh, a lot of great games came out of the 64 and uh, Dermy and Ozzy will take a look at that later on in the I show. I wonder if they'll look at the one game I remember most about that console, Blast Calls. It's not like... Ex I don't exactly. That. It was like kind of this unremarkable game in the grand scheme of things, but it was the game like... I think I played it over a cousin's house or at an in-store uh, in demo when they still had those things and it's just imprinted itself in my mind. Well, Goldeneye was that game for me because friends would always play Odd Job because they were jerks. Yes. And Odd Job was smaller and I was always playing the helicopter pilot. Don't know why. <laughs> because you, do you want to compensate for the lowness of Odd Job by like getting With super high? Head, yes. <laughs> and like, and I'm assuming helicopter pilot, so he had little twirly things going on in his head as well, right? Right, he just had like a helmet. I, I can't really remember. It was, uh, all I remember was the fun that I had with that game. Well, I certainly don't remember the fun that I didn't have that I had by that game. <laughs> uh, later on in the episode, we do look at uh, the new Warcraft movie as well. Yes. Um, and Liam is a huge fanboy of Duncan Jones, the He's director. He's insisted that we mention this in the opening links. Yes. Uh, he says that everyone should go watch Moon. Um, maybe not everyone go watch Warcraft. We'll find out later on in the episode. We'll also find out about Homefront the Revolution. The reboot, I guess, of that franchise. But until then, let's go into our first segment. So Knights of Azura is the new IP from RPG darlings Gus. And it's being released by Koei Tecmo, another sort of burgeoning company in the West. So this is a game that had a lot of hype behind it and has some very big names involved. Yeah, it's, it was one of those things that um, was sort of announced as a project. It was called the Shoujo X Gus project, um, which was sort of that it's, it's a new thing from Gus. They haven't done anything different other than the Atelier games for a while. So. Everyone was kind of looking forward to see what it is. And to be honest, I'm very surprised it's not just a straight up RPG. Yeah, it's actually a dungeon crawling hack and slasher with monster summoning elements yeah. and waifus, which I, I guess is, is less shocking. So yeah, two main female characters. It's the story is fairly straightforward, I guess. Uh, chapter format type. I guess you progress through chapter by chapter and... Yeah, yeah. It's got yeah. typical Gust sort of visual novel elements to mm. it as well. By doing side quests, you unlock more interactions between the characters. A lot of them are quirky and quite fun, but yeah. um, at the same time, there's, there's still the sort of typical Gust cringe to them. The dungeons are, are fun, they're expansive, they're interlinked, but ultimately, like, it does come back to the idea that you're just hacking and slashing yep. a lot, and you know, it, it can get a, a little bit flat, albeit fun. But I think more than anything, this game is one that appeals to Gust fans, it appeals to Koei Tecmo fans, and it appeals to anyone who likes JRPGs. But if you're not one of those eight people in Australia, then yeah. there probably isn't much here for you. But, yeah. <laughs> Meh. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Donald, I'm going to pitch you a game. Go. So, all right. So, uh, horse racing game. Everyone okay. likes horse racing. Yeah, well, yeah. most people like horse racing. Um, but instead of like controlling, say, like the meters and the energy and stuff of your horse and like your empire, you play solitaire. What? So. <laughs> <laughs> that's basically that's what happened at the Game Freak office. Someone's walked in the office and suggested that game, and then they made that game. And the worst part of it, it's fantastic. It really is, <laughs> because there's just so many little things that make you feel good when you're playing this game. And just let's take the base level, the yeah. solitaire aspect. It's not it's speed solitaire, so yes, you're yeah. only worrying about matching consequential uh, uh, sequential numbers, yes. as opposed to matching suits. It's quick, it's fine, and it's a giddy little thrill from there. Yeah, so basically, like, the idea is you'll be presented with the, the field, you've got to, like, try and get as many combos as you can to try and clear as many cards, and you'll come to, like, a stop, 
flip the next card, try and fill that. Basically, how well you do or how, how poorly you do will directly affect the unity power of you and your horse. That will affect how much power then gets converted to its overall energy and stamina. Uh, and then you do that over five or six times as you're racing, or depending on the type of horse. And then by the end of it, you have to control your horse as it runs to the finish line. It's the most contrived, overly like developed game I've ever and played. And you haven't even mentioned the game layer on top of that, where you train your horses up, yep. you have them race at a mature level, then you have them retire and breed with other horses yes, to make uh, more powerful uh, horses. Yeah, so, you, so there's two different modes. And look, honestly, as, as, as daunting as all that sounds, it all starts to make sense. You still will need to use the tutorials at times, but as a, as a great time waster, I just, I haven't sunk this much time into just a time sink in such a long time. Like, there are so many mechanics on hand, but they all work together, and indeed, the mechanics, the depth of them, it just, it gives you the gumption to play this game for. How long have you been playing this game now? Only 55 hours, but keep in mind that this is a Game Freak game, so in the grand scheme of things, that's not a lot for a Game Freak game. Here with Timothy Omerson. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So let's start a long time ago. First of all, let's set a ground rule. Okay, yeah. Um, you have to promise me mm -hmm. if I have a coffee foam mustache at any mm -hmm. point, you will alert me. Okay. Thank you. And what do you want me to do once I alert you? You could just say you've got a little thing. Okay, cool. So let's, like let's, get test a it. let's test it out. Sure. Well before Uncle Ann. Oh, the beginning, if you will. Yes. Eli. Mm. What was with that guy? Savory, Jesus-y, John the Baptist-y kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, started out as a street musician. Yeah. Of, like, he could strain pasta on your way. <laughs> yes, he could. <laughs> <laughs> have you taken any of the teachings of Eli to heart, or have you pretty much gone out in the hopes of reversing all of the peace next stuff? There maybe was a day when I tried to, uh, to uh, be a little more... Calm that went quickly away as Hollywood beat it out of me. Yeah. Although lately, mm -hmm. I've attempted to uh, come back to something. I started, started trying to learn how it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's all right. Cool. So, so Gallivant was great. Mm, thank you for noticing. But it's kind of hard to describe without going into things like it's kind of like Monty Python if it was now and really awesome. Okay, here's how, how I go. Here's how I go. If, if uh, Monty Python mm -hmm. and Mel Brooks had a baby, yeah. and that baby had an illicit affair with the movie Princess Bride, yes. and that demon offspring mm -hmm. got jiggy with Alan Menken, who wrote every Disney musical you've ever heard, mm -hmm. that would be Gallivant. Added with an extra spice of delicious line. Come on. <laughs> it was good. It was good. Uh, what was your favorite song from the show? How do you choose which child you love the most? The one um, that irritates you the least at the time? That would be it. Um, season one, it was the lullaby that uh, I sang to Vinnie oh. Jones. Come on. That I could... Here's this thing. This show was the mm. silliest... It's just a silly, light little piece of... Mm, but yet, it challenged... That was pretty gorgeous. That was nice. Um, had Eli come to Gallivant... Would he have survived very long? And who would have killed him? Oh, who would have... Well, he would have survived for a while. He still had his mm. magic mojo. Plus, oh. he had the power of whoever behind him. Um, I think he and initially the young Eli, the early Eli, yeah. uh, Debbie Eli, um, would have hung out with Neosporin Neo of Sporin, hmm. and uh, you know Reese Shearsmith and uh, Xanax, Ricky Gervais. Yeah. They would have um, started a co-op for charlatan oh, that medicine. Would have been great. That would have been really good. Yeah. He was not nearly as funny as Eli. Not a lot of f humor in Eli. No. Um, Eli kind of sucked a lot of the joy out of. He him. really <laughs> did. Yeah. No wonder he got a sore through the sternum. Hmm. Which was sad, but. Kind of had it coming, I mean, yeah. and sort of fulfilled the prophecy, and then he was still there. Yeah. Not saying he was Jesus, but kind might of have was. been. Yeah. And on that note, calling yourself Jesus, I think we I should... I did not call myself <laughs> Jesus. 
<laughs> Let's be very clear. He was a Jesus-like character. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, I'm joined by Kate here to talk about the new Warcraft film based on the long-running game series Warcraft The Beginning. Now, Kate, you've played a bit of WoW. Tell us about your experience. Yeah, so I've played on and off since vanilla. Um, play for Alliance. Uh, you, won't, you won't be able to see it here, but Tim is currently glaring at us <laughs> off camera, being a hardcore horde player. Um, so you played for a while, you played a couple of different characters. Uh, I played on and off as well, but I've stopped. I'm, I'm off the junk. Um, <laughs> But I played a well. I played a bit of um, Warcraft Three, but I'm not really that knowledgeable about the lore. Yes, well, I wasn't either. I knew a little bit from the Warlords of Jonah expansion, so I was familiar with like Kaggar and Druitan and those characters. But then some of the others, I was new to. <laughs> so the story is kind of the birth of the Alliance, where the human world is getting invaded by the orcs, and what's happening, uh, why the orcs are invading. Um, what the sort of humans are doing. Um, and it, it is a sort of, for, for me, I, I knew about the world. Um, I didn't know too much about the law, and they obviously want this to be a jumping on point. Yeah, um, and I found the orcs were very humanized. Um, I guess you can say that. Yeah, yeah so, sort of. Um, I mean, the main character, Gul'dan, obviously, he's the antagonist. Um, but it's not like the orcs are the bad guys and humans are the good guys. No. Um, it, like the game that they're, they're you know, that, that's, that both races have uh, a reason that they're doing what they're doing. Um, so I think that they did sort of show both sides being able to, you know, there's not just good guys, bad guys, a bit more to it. Um, I, I think obviously it is a big um, Hollywood fantasy blockbuster. They do want you to be able to jump in and I think you could jump in without having played any of the games. Um, but it is the start of a franchise. So... They have a lot of different threads, a lot of different characters, a lot of locations. That sometimes it's, there's a lot of stuff happening. Yeah, I, I did find it, find it very nostalgic seeing like Stormwood, Ironforge, and they looked just like on the game. So yeah, there's a, I, I remember seeing a couple of times where the camera would um, almost like as a, you know the RTS, the original Warcraft games, where the camera would be flying over cities and yeah. armies fighting like. Yep, this is what they're doing. They're paying homage to the games. Yeah. Um, and obviously there's nitpicking, but there's also nice references. And I think it's a good Hollywood blockbuster. And I enjoyed it. Yeah, and yeah, my favourite bit, pull him off from the sheep, into the sheep. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Old Game Plus, And today we're going to talk about the anniversary of this thing, the Nintendo 64 turning 20 years old. And the uh, first console to have a controller made for aliens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, very loved console by gamers, wasn't it? Yes. So it was released in 1996, um, sold 3 million copies, and it was the last cartridge-based system um, in a home console form. So, yeah, the last one. And uh, out, of, out of the 33 million um, uh, consoles that sold, about 20, of them, 20 million of them got sold U.S., and considering, or North America, and considering the population there, that's a very, very high penetration for that console, isn't it? Very, very. Um, now, the um, it also was the uh, the delivery mechanism for one of the most loved games of all time. <laughs> yeah, Super Mario 64, uh, which was one of the first kind of 3D, kind of 3D motion camera kind of games and revolutionary because of it. And it's probably lucky because they moved to cartridge they the its competitors PlayStation One and Saturn went to CD, yeah, and that caused a bit of a problem with with a big developer. Yeah, well, cartridge system, one of the pros of it was that it would um, no load times, so it would read straight off the cartridge. Um, but one of the problems with it was that it, you could only fit a maximum of sixty four meg of game on it, which compared to a CD, which was six hundred and fifty meg. Um, alienated some some developers such as famously Square and big, others like one. Konami. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and uh, so Final Fantasy VII came out on a couple of couple of CDs, uh, and they came out in the PlayStation One because of because the yeah format. the cartridge format would not hold the game that they were making. And it wasn't the only sort of sliding doors sort of uh, thing that happened around that time. The chip inside this. Um, yes. Now, Silicon Graphics were, were like real powerhouses in that area at the time, and they developed the chip for 
for Sega. Sega. <laughs> <laughs> Originally, they were gonna they did a deal with Sega to make this chip, and when that deal fell through because Sega Japan didn't want to go with an American, um, you know, technology. Um, yeah, Sega kind of said, okay, um, well, Nintendo, would you like a chip? So Sega, <laughs> so Sega actually offered <laughs> the chip to Nintendo to make that. And, and what you ended up with was Mario 64 and a, and a 3D powerhouse and the Saturn, which, uh, which Sega Japan decided to have more control over, ended up as a 2D powerhouse in an age where we... We've we'll kind of moved to 3D, 3D so, yeah. Yeah, things could have been very, very, very different. Yeah. So, uh, but, but when it came out, it had many many different color, colors, many different styles. There's like orange ones, this Pokemon one, there was the original dark gray one. Yeah, there's transparent ones and stuff. They're yeah. very inventive with it. And I think that helped with it, sort of like that personality with it too. Because it really was a console that, that the gamers that had loved. Yeah. They loved the games. Um, some of the games were amazing. Well, the first, first Smash Brothers... Yep, um, it, the Golden Eye sixty four, um, Perfect Dark, the Banjo Kazooie series, Conquer, yeah, very un Nintendo, game. and very famously Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, which people will argue about forever on which one was better. Yeah, so a, a, a fantastic console. Um, it, it came along at a very interesting time for gaming with those three consoles coming out. A few sort of little uh, sliding doors moments there with the chip and the the cartridge versus CD. Yep, but uh, a very loved console for gamers. Yep. The N64. Ah, the San Francisco Bay. Now, from this trailer, Watch Dogs 2 looks a lot better than the first one. Yeah, but like, so many things look better than what Watch Dogs 1 ended up becoming. Like, nothing could meet the promise of that first look that we got of that game. No, and it looks like, well, Ubisoft is trying to it, like inflate expectations, but they're not promising us the world. They're just promising, promising us uh, an interesting, unique, open-world hacking game. Yes, they are notorious for their downgrades from E3 showings and then the final game. So hopefully that doesn't happen too much with Watch Dogs 2. Uh, but what the feel that I get from it is the like the '90s hackers movie. That's like the cringiness <laughs> I feel when I'm like looking at these characters. Like you just imagine people just doing that to yeah. hack onto their laptops. Yeah, uh, like I get a real vibe of CSI Cyber. Like just the fact that everything can be hacked. You see that car? Hackable. Yeah. That toaster? You can hack it. That coffee maker? Oh my god, that coffee maker's being cybered. While, while there's some actually scary hacking stuff that people can do with cars, like they can shut down yeah. your engine if the if it's connected enough. Turn uh, off brake functionality, that's yeah, creepy. Yes, um, but I don't think it's going to be approached in this sort of game. Uh, it no. just looks like rebels fighting against the establishment. and That's what young kids do, apparently. Yeah, well, you and I are young people. At least I pretend I'm a young person. You, you do that all the time, don't you? Not that you're willing to admit it on camera, though, are you? Now, Shaney, everybody has great memories of the uh, THQ game 
home front. Okay. No, sorry, they have bad memories of that game because it kind of sucked. It, but yeah. then they made they, they made a new one, but it's not a sequel; it's a reboot. So I guess they recognise straight away how bad the original game was. And it's been in development hell for a couple of years. Okay, it's not sounding good. Like, yeah, this is not. Yeah. Okay, but Homefront: The Revolution. Mm-hmm. Believe it or not, despite all those kind of things, I enjoyed it. I think more than I should have. Like, I, I don't know. Like, what, what are your first impressions from the game, Shani? It's Far Cry. That's basically it. You, instead yep. of a jungle, you're in a concrete jungle. Ah, that's good. Um, so, yes, you are. So, you, you're in Philadelphia. So, you're in the, the, the ruined city of Philadelphia. You're going from place to place, taking you know, sp- uh, strike points, yeah. different points. They all have tactical advantages, all that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. So, it, it's Far Cry formula. You know what to expect. They've added on weapon customization, which, quite, like, everything in this game feels like it kind of works. It has a really good like idea of what it wants to be. It grabs a little bit too much, I'd say. It's uh, and then it doesn't really refine the anything. The problem with these guys has always been scope. Group. Yeah. Think of Hayes. Think of all of these games. Like they'd be good games if they just kept the scope. Mm. You know what I mean? And because they don't, it, it too much kind of comes in. The weapon customization is fun, but it's not quite polished enough. No. Like you could, there's characters that come in that don't really do anything and don't really exist. The storyline is fine. Like there's. Enough of the game there that I, I felt I still really enjoyed it, despite the bugs. But my God, is it buggy! Like even in like like the parts I saw with you, where like people would set on fire, then they just sit down. And then yeah, like me down. There, there's parts where enemies just don't exist. Even if you don't shoot them, then nobody, no shots, no nothing's fired. They just despawn. It's like a NES game. You yeah. can despawn enemies basically. Yeah. And then there's like times where it saves. You, you, and you're, and you're frozen for, for yeah. like two minutes and stuff. So, look, it is tough because, you know, this is a game that I think people have always liked the concept of America fighting the foreign power. I, I don't. Th- I think the concept itself works. It's that Red Dawn kind of, you know. I, but the problem is it's North Korea. It, like, if you're already removing us from the reality of, you know, North Korea being a power enough to take over America, then why did it need to be North Korea? And you really, so you just want to say China. Just say China. Like, let's be real. They do want to say that, but even then, it's like they're taking over a country that has literally run itself to the ground. There is half no... the world away. Well, the, and then uh, half the world away. Like there is literally no reason to take over America. They just want to. Especially they just do at that it. Point. But look, all these things aside, yeah. I played twenty five hours. I clocked the game, and I I'm not sad for doing it. Would I do it again? Maybe not. Would I pay a hundred dollars for it? Maybe not. But did I enjoy my time with Homefront the Revolution? No. Uh, wait, what? that was me. Yes. Sorry. No, what well, I did. I did. Don't listen to him. It's fine. Out of all the series to resurrect Homefront? Uh, I don't know. Maybe they're trying to... I don't know. Is the world in a different space that it was when the original Homefront came out? Yeah, fair. I don't know. It's a different kind of fear. So, like, it's a much more complex fear. So yeah. I suppose it's easier to go back to the days where you're worried worried about a, fic- a, a fictional sort of conflict that will probably never happen in the real world. Yeah, everyone's been pointing out, oh, it's North Korea will never take over America. It's, it's a fictional world. If you can get over that hump, yeah. it's like... It just play the game and judge the game on its merits rather than its real world I don't know, applicability. But also, like the first game, essentially just made no waves whatsoever. I remember reviewing it all the way back when, and it was completely unremarkable. Yeah, um, and, and indeed, kind of just um, ham-fisted in other moments too. To be fair, I don't think the source material is uh, something that they can expand on that much. It's been done and uh, I really don't think you can show much more in that sort of So area. instead, take the setting, throw in some Far Cry, throw in some Crisis. But and... even Far Cry has been done so much recently that although, it's starting although, to become a Although, does it have the egregiously long low times that this Xbox One version of Homefront did? <laughs> we were playing the game in the background as we were reviewing that. Like we had Long to, low times. we had to like <laughs> the review was had to be halted by a little bit just because we were waiting for the game to actually load. Yes, and this is of course games of the future where we have to wait minutes for. But apparently for that to it load. loads everything at once, so you don't get constant loading screen. So at least there's that compilation. Yes, yes. So that's it for this week. We do have some events coming up. We would have just come out of TGF, 
It's probably one last day happening after if this If you're watching airs. this on CP1 in Melbourne, yes. Yes, uh, but we have the Pokemon Nationals coming up. Yes, if you are in Melbourne, the Pokemon Nationals for both, for both the video game and the trading card game will be taking place at Melbourne Park. We as New Game Plus will be streaming the video game side of things, so do check it out. Yes, for details, check out our Facebook, but... First, go to our website, www.newgameplus.tv. Then go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash newgameplustv. Follow our Twitter and Instagram at newgameplustv. And subscribe to us on YouTube and Twitch. We are newgameplustv, one word, no spaces. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Tim. We'll see you guys next week.